for me, acting was a calling in its own way, right? So I, I would consider myself an actor before I was an activist, but in the process, I also realized the, the, the needs that were required in the neighborhood. So I was a mentor or a tutor, right, at a Jackie Robinson Center for Physical Culture before I started working on The Wire. And then um, started reading a book called The Way They Learn and understanding this prison to pipeline, this school to prison pipeline situation that's going on. I learned that out early on in regards from the third grade. So that pushed me into this area of becoming um, an activist, just not wanting to be slighted. And then I had a guy, he was like my mentor also, his name was Sonny Carson. So Sonny Carson, which was just constantly pushing me and telling me, listen, you got the potential to lead in the neighborhood and you got a lot of dudes, you know a lot of dudes, a lot of brothers out here and you could, you know, you know, navigate them in the right direction. So with that, I started trying to, um, not even trying, but doing it, like changing the lives of um, youth in the community through mentorship, through programs like working in martial arts and drama, but there were always free programs that I didn't charge for. So for me, it was just taking action right there and then and, um, and, and shifting lives. Like now that, you know, like I'm traveling the world, that I am an act, uh, actress, like, I want to be more involved in my community because I see a lot of things that I could have done, you know, now I can do it because I have, you know, like Jamie said, like a lot of dudes, like just the neighborhood behind you. It, like, it, it starts with you. Yeah, it, the resources. It starts with you, but you got to go to the, the person in the neighborhood that call all the shots you want to see. I grew up in New Orleans and uh, the two are synonymous for me. Art was always activism in New Orleans. You see a second line that started by social aid and pleasure clubs. We understand the pleasure part. But the social aid part was, you know, um, uh, during segregation and Jim Crow laws, uh, when neighborhoods were redlined and you didn't have access to health care, you couldn't go to hospitals, uh, you couldn't get insurance, you couldn't even get burial plots. We pooled our money in social aid and pleasure clubs. Uh, and the social aid part was, if your mama takes sick, we'll take care of you. If your daddy dies, we're going to send him off nice. And what the world knows as a jazz funeral was actually a social uh, act of, 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 of insurance, really, uh, where the neighborhood takes care of each other. So these cultural events were always that of activism, especially in times when uh, poor and, and African-American communities that were ostracized and in the middle of segregation didn't have anything. For me as an actor, I started and was inspired by the Free Southern Theater, which was a theater company that started in New Orleans during uh, the Civil Rights Movement. And they would go uh, to marches and perform plays, and perform plays in, uh, throughout the South under the threat of violence from the Klan. Uh, they were known for actually not coming out for the curtain call, because that's when they expected all the violence to go down. They would kind of do the play and get in the cars and jump back to New Orleans. <laughs> uh, so for me, the two are synonymous, and you have the legacy of Men like uh, Harry Belafonte and women like Ruby Dee and, uh, 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 and, and Ozzie Davis and all those people that kind of uh, passed on the baton of responsibility and legacy that Absolutely. you, as an actor, should be an activist. I, w I was a reluctant actress for most of the time I've been acting. Um, um, and I, because I started out writing and I'd always believed that I was supposed, that my life was supposed to mean something and have some sense of, of a, a, a distinct purpose. And I was here to accomplish something. And I could never, for the life of me, marry acting to that. I wondered, you know, where that was really, how was that going to change the world? Um, or, um, or allow me to impact the world um, through a sense of purpose. Um, and it was something I followed as it followed me through my spoken word career. Um, and I grew up in a home where um, my father, um, in a home in which my father was the local, um, he's that community member from the hood that shows up at a city council meeting. And you, you he starts speaking, he's very articulate. And, and you go, who is that? Like, you know, because in those arenas, I, you know, I've been to these types of meetings, and they don't expect, I mean, there's a lot of them, there's, there's not an expectation um, that a man of my father's stature would, um, would be able to speak eloquently about and, uh, and in detail about the issues that were affecting my community. So at any rate, I was raised by a man like that. 
And I think because um, uh, I always had that sort of seed planted in me from early on um, that I was supposed, I was here to do some type of good. Uh, when I when it came to when I discovered that acting or my ability to have a platform through acting could be utilized for the greater good, that's when it all came together for me. And I thought, oh wow, so this is how I can do this. And we were together when I had that epiphany. Um, the, um, the Obama was, it was it, and I'm going to just tell the story. I was, that was a long-winded way of saying something very simple, but this story is important. In 2008, we were, Wirecast were invited to do some voter empowerment work by Mark Morial and the National Ur Urban League. They were traveling through the state of Virginia um, uh, and asking us to, to join them. After that, we, we were asked to, we were invited to um, go to Carolina and um, campaign on behalf of Obama. And it was my experiences there when I saw that people, like, you know, hundreds, you know, these college campuses, could be thousands, right? Thousands. Of people were coming, you know, coming to hear what we had to say and get encouraged, you know, uh, and inspired by what we had to say. That was a, just a major moment. It's like, wow, we can get folks out like that. Um, what we are saying has to be important. And then we went to Carolina, and we all had different experiences. You were in Carolina, right, Jamie? I was there. Jamie was there. And I had to leave. You were on the, in, in Virginia. Right. But Mark Morial was talking to us about Harry Belafonte. Now, you knew all this, because you had this in your background, and you were part of this conversation, too. But we were on this long bus ride, and they were just talking to us about how, you know, I, you know, back in the 60s, the artists and actors, you know, you know, were a part of the civil rights movement, and, and you know, there's a gap there, and it's one that I clearly saw, and you saw the light bulb go off in my head, and I started having these side conversations with them um, about what are we going to do? Um, what are we going to do after this? We've got to do something with this, and then and, and the other part yeah. was Sonia said after this election. <laughs> It's not the end, it's just the beginning. Sure did. And I realized that I'm gonna, we're going to have to be a lot more involved after this. And that was literally the birth of Rewired for Change, her organization. Mm -hmm. She said, all right, I see that we're having an impact on getting people out to vote, but now uh, we're going to have to really commit to being there for the long term. And, uh, and, the, and I, she literally, on that bus trip, when we were riding around getting out to vote, she put together the organization. Mm. You know, now we see the ramifications of doing great art. You see, what thoughts are to the individual, where you reflect on who you are and who you hope to be, and you lie awake at night with sort of man or woman you want to be, your failures, your, your triumphs. What those thoughts are to you, art is the form where we collectively decide who we are, what our failures are, what our values are, and then act on them. That's the whole reason we do art. Entertainment is just a residual of that. But it's the public discourse that you engender and you decide on who you are. That's why when the uprising happened in Baltimore last year, the media reached out to us, yes. which was an amazing thing, because they knew we had started this public discourse going all the way back to 2000, and they were seeing the ramifications of it. Uh, I actually was about to leave The Wire one season after the school year, which was a great season. And uh, I met one of the actors, and she came up to me and said, "Oh." Mr. Pierce, we didn't have anything to do. I was on the show this year. I said, who did you play? She said, oh, you know, um, I, was in, I was in the, I'm, I'm a lot older than I am. I look like uh, I'm in middle school, but I'm graduating high school and I'm going to Brown University next year on scholarship. And I'm like, so who did you play? And she said, I forget the character's name, uh, the, the girl who slices the other girl's face. Oh, yeah. and I was like, you played her? <laughs> And you're going to Brown? I said, why aren't we telling your story? And then I said, and I went home after we finished it, and I said, I think I'm going to leave the show. Mm. And then I saw the season, and I thought it was for the first time it was a real examination of where we lose our kids. Mm. Of where, you know, when you see, when we, when we see Dookie and Mike and all of them, just the intersection of how we lose our kids. And then I said, okay, our violence and this dysfunction is not arbitrary. We're saying something. So that allowed me to come back and finish the show. So that's the role of what I think The Wire played um, from beginning to end. You know, 
Uh, I had a similar, well, for me, I wasn't never thinking about leaving the show, even though it affected me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I got a show? Pause. I'm staying. <laughs> but with what happened to Wendell, um, it was, I, I had a similar circumstance happen to me twice, right? So I'm walking outside the house in, um, in Baltimore, and there was a, a Jeep that drove by, and dude looked out the window and said, Marlo, a couple of guys in the Jeep, and they said, I'm trying to be like you. I'm moving a couple of keys. Right there, just click. And I was like, what am I doing, right? So then, fast forward, I'm in a club in, um, in DC, and a guy comes up to me and he says, look, um, I do this for real, so if you know anybody wanna lay down wherever you're from, you know, you just, I was like, my man, it's a TV show. <laughs> but with that, I said, what am I doing? So I sat down with a friend of mine, and you know, he was a director, and we were just talking about it, and I was just talking about the things that I do in the community and how I, you know, I'm really about changing lives. And I said, am I taking a backwards step playing the character that will also shape the lives of young folks coming up all around the world? And then I saw the entire season. And then I realized, damn, Jamie, you're kind of selfish. It's not about you. <laughs> Marlo is just a small part in a bigger picture of a story that needs to be told. So being in that piece right there and um, seeing it from that scope and seeing how we truly affected lives from New York to LA in urban communities and anybody can open that or pop that series in and so many other outlets that were formed outside of this. You know, I met so many people along the way that said, you know, I was an attorney but I changed my life to becoming a professor or becoming an activist in some way because your story changed my life because I felt for Dookie because I felt for this character, because I felt for that character. We were in um, Martha's Vineyard um, raising money for President Obama, and the amount of people that approached us based on that story. You know, you had cats coming to us from the street perspective. You have those coming from law enforcement, those coming from um, the political perspective. And they, everybody just affected them in a different way, but overall they read the story or saw the story and read it like a book. And so that, that, you know, in seeing that, I realized how that, how I played a part in that and how we all played a part in something great. And see me, you feel it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and see me, I was less fortunate because these guys, I take my head off to y'all, I learned a lot on the show. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a part of the problem. I was part of, part of the problem. Now I'm trying to solve it, you yeah. know what I mean? I'm, thank you. You know, I'm part of the solution because I know from just being in the streets what it takes to just what, just, man, it's, it's just crazy out there. Then I've been on a show and Ed Burns and David Simon, I'll never forget this. They was like, and this was season three, and I was, um, the scene that we was in the, um, the pigeon coop. Yeah. Okay. And you was like, it's your turn now, girl. Mm -hmm. And I was like, huh? I ain't even understand what was going on. <laughs> 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 but, you know, David Simon and Ed Burns and Nina, they came to me. Listen, they was already on season four. I mean, oh uh, yeah, season four. We're going to make you a star. You got to finish doing what you're doing in the streets, please. Just let everything go. And I did that. I did that. Season three. I kept my little bit of money that I had from off the streets and gave everything else away. Because I seen and I believed in Ed Burns and David Simon and Nina that they was going to not even make me a star. Just, you know, just make me a better person within me. I remember it was around maybe the end of the first season or somewhere around there, somewhere maybe even the second season, but we all started to realize that, because a lot of us, this, this was our first really big, big gig, you know, um, and and we were just caught up in just like, you got a new job and you're on TV and there's yeah. all kinds of shit you got to work out. <laughs> and and you having these, you know, private conversations about yourself. The first season I had the same thing. It was like, I can't, what am I, I can't do this. I'm playing a cop. I was in a problem playing a cop because where I come from, I, I had bad memories of the cop. I had a resentment from a cop in my home at eight years old still on my back. I didn't even know it until I had to play a cop. 
Wow. And I went through a lot of personal shit to just be here. And I, I prayed and cried. I was like, why are you making me doing this? God, I'm just here because I know you got something for me. <laughs> because I've been doing this with you for a while, going, you know, diving off of cliffs and we've been coming up. But this shit right here, I don't <laughs> know, that's too much. It's too much pressure. I don't care about the money. I just need, like, to be, to do something important in the world. But I just felt like there was something else going on. And after about a year of that, you know, that was my version. We all had different mm -hmm. versions of it, yeah. those conversations. Because I, 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 you told me that uh, yeah, absolutely. those stories. You know, and we were all helping each other work it out like family do. Okay, a lot of us had come to the town. So whenever an actor would come to town, it, it, you know, we would immediately surround them. We, it was just us hanging out with each other. But it was like we were living this kind of parallel universe of the wire in our own on the side, okay?